Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here uh, virtually you know, with everybody um, as well. And uh, it's hard to imagine that it's been six months since I spoke with everybody last. It seems like so much has happened and the world has changed um, and continues to change very quickly. So I hope everyone is doing as well as possible and um, that I and, and most everyone here is hopefully get, getting strength from the one constant that is in our lives, which is science and of course the amazing universe that we get to study every day. Uh, so along um, the lines of just giving you guys an overview of galaxy evolution and what we are, we've been up to, and just as a reminder, galaxy evolution is really focused on three main themes. The first is how chemical elements accumulate in galaxies and in their surroundings. How The second is how visible and dark matter assembles within galaxies. The third is how ionizing radiation is produced and escapes um, galaxies. And I'd like to, um, from my perspective, an emerging strength of the Galaxy Evolution Project is connecting the physics of galaxies on the, from the sub-kiloparsec to kiloparsec scale, in particular with using uh, IFUs. So I just like to start with some highlights from the um, last year or so, uh, which is I think is amazing. Um, so in, since about 2018, we've had 20, more than 20 successful observing proposals on eight to 10 meter class telescopes. Several of these proposals have been led by PhD students. In 2019 alone, I think we not, I normally counted about 60 or more talks given by Galaxy Evolution team members, both in Australia and internationally. We're on track to um, publish um, more than 90 refereed papers um, led by Galaxy Evolution members by the end of this year. The Galaxy Evolution team, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think is really becoming an IFU powerhouse. Um, the members are using a range of IFUs across the existing telescopes, including MUSE, KMOS, and GMOS, and of course are contributing to um, surveys such as MAGPI, Koala and Sammy, which we heard so much about earlier today. And uh, one aspect that I'm really appreciating is that with our monthly uh, Galaxy Evolution Zooms and liaisons to other Astro 3D projects, we're really getting cross-pollination across the um, different Astro 3D projects beyond Galaxy Evolution. And we saw a little bit of that earlier today already, and I'm sure we'll see more of it later. And that's something that I think will um, continue to grow naturally in the second half of the center. Uh, so here are just some nice um, pictures from, from the different galaxy evolution projects. So moving now towards some science highlight, I'm going to start in the very, very local universe, uh, very local, in the LMC and the SM, uh, SMC. And this is work led by Katie Grasha, where she, uh, essentially she's showing that stellar abundance patterns really do matter. And uh, this is a beautiful image. I'm always super jealous of people who actually get to look at the local universe in such great detail. And um, what she shows here in these panels is essentially, hopefully everybody can see that the black um, line and the pink lines are, are different. And the black lines correspond to assuming solar abundance patterns, and then the pink lines correspond to assuming a galactic concordance. And the um, spectrum, the ionizing spectrum that you get, depending on which of those you assume actually does vary. And so, of course, in terms of interpreting the ionizing spectrum around these massive stars, this is very relevant to the work that we do, of course, across a range of redshift, but certainly a high redshift in terms of interpreting um, the ionization and metallicity um, uh, conditions of, of galaxies. This is work that she's um, in, uh, is working on currently. In terms of what happens to these metals once you actually make them, this is now work led by um, Phil Taylor. And um, using simulations, he shows that actually your ability to hold on to the metals that you make depend on your star formation histories. And so in the figure that you see here, uh, for massive galaxies, massive quenched galaxies, and the massive quenched galaxies are the ones that are above the diagonal dashed line here, they tend to lose more of their metals, and this is primarily due to AGN and outflows, compared to their lower mass um, star forming, sorry, not lower mass, lower star forming counterparts at the same mass. 
Uh, and Katie and, and Phil are actually now also collaborating on using Katie's measurements in the local universe to test the unknown enrichment models from uh, and predictions from, from Phil's simulation. So that's a, an exciting new direction. In terms of how we can interpret the observation, uh, this is a work led by Ayan Acharya, and uh, what Ayan shows is that, not surprisingly, your ability to recover, say, gas metallicity gradients really depends on your data quality. And so what he shows here is that uh, with decreasing spatial IFE resolution and decreasing signal noise, you artificially flatten the metallicity gradients. And these are two figures here showing the steeper than true gradient versus the shower than true gradient. And you see that essentially most of the time it's, it's below this dotted line. Now, fortunately for Sammy, Sammy's really, um, I think, uh, uh, fine. It looks like there, there isn't a lot of artificial flattening due to the um, observational constraints, which I, I'm sure given that the metallicity works and um, uh, studies that we heard earlier today is, is of some relief. Oh, that's not the right button. And then moving on, um, seeing in the very local universe, but moving on to the ionization front, um, this is work led by Rob Bassett in terms of trying to understand how Lyman continuum photons are related to strong emission lines. So right now there's a lot of the debate as to whether or not strong emission line ratios, like very high, high ratios, corresponds with um, enhanced uh, Lyman continuum photons. Uh, uh, referring, of course, to Uris's talk that we just heard earlier. And so Rob uh, is leading Koala, which is essentially a study of um, H2 regions around the massive stars in the LMC and the SMC. And what you'll see here are the IFU maps around these stars, and the colors correspond to different emission lines, and primarily oxygen and hydrogen emission lines. And what you can see, I think, is that it's quite patchy. So when you're able to actually um, map the emission around the, uh, the ionized regions around these stars, you see that, that it, there's a lot of structure there. And so hopefully Koala will give us an insight into how the geometry of the gas and the dust um, around these stars actually matters in terms of how much Lyman continuum uh, emission is allowed to escape. And uh, I think so far Koala gets a prize for the cutest logo, honestly. There. And then moving on to ionization, but at higher redshift, so this is um, results from Anisha Harshan, who's uh, working with me at UNSW. And uh, she, this is her first lead author paper that she just published um, earlier this year, where she looks at the electron density of galaxies and clusters and um, shows that the electron density increases with redshift. And this is something that's also seen in the field. Um, she actually sees some tentative evidence that the electron density um, evolution in cluster galaxies actually may be stronger than that observed in the field. And what you see here is the 2D spectrum from MOS fire, where you see that nice oxygen 2 doublet that's split, and then the 1D spectrum. And the figure here is the electron density. The points themselves are measurements from Anisha, and, as well as other studies at risk of one and a half to two and a half. Um, and what you hopefully can see is that individual points um, lie above the contours, and those contours are um, the electron densities measured in the local universe with Sloan. Now moving on to what you can do with IFUs. Um, this is work led by Sarah Sweet, and she is moving towards um, quantitative galaxy morphology. That's also quite relevant to the talks we heard earlier today regarding um, the kinematics from SAMI, kinematic maps, and uh, some of the work from that was discussed earlier. And so what she um, is, has shown in her recent paper is that you know, combining spatial kinematics with photometry um, using galaxies from the Cleefit survey, which is an IFU survey of local galaxies, she shows that you can actually move towards this quantitative galaxy morphology. Um, there's this uh, probability distribution function, if I'm saying that correctly, that essentially embeds the um, it encodes the kinematic and photometric information in a way that allows you to separate morphology uh, that, uh, um, uh, that, that follows morphology and Bolsha total ratio. And so that's illustrated here with these three represented uh, example galaxies as you move from the left 
to the, to the right, you're of course having a nice disk dominated galaxies versus one that's more bulge dominated. And these uh, three galaxies are shown here in, in the figure to the right where the um, x-axis is bulge to total fraction and the um, y-axis is morphological type. So here are your three example galaxies and they follow that nice trend that separates the, the different galaxy types. We can also use IFUs to measure kinematics of galaxies at higher redshift. This is work led by Trevor Mandel um, in the paper that is currently on the referee. And what he shows is um, using uh, IFU maps that the dark matter fraction of IS and galaxies at the redshift 1.8 seems to be lower than that, that um, than the, the fractions that we observe in the local universe, as shown here, um, for in comparison, say, to Atlas 3D, which is this curved line in the plot on the, the right-hand side. And these are examples of the 2D uh, images from HST of galaxies from his survey, where the, the red circle is the effective radius of those galaxies. So if the dark matter fractions are evolving um, in, in galaxies, that's obviously very relevant to trying to understand galaxies form and evolve. And it would be great to try to um, build a, um, a, a sample that spans the full range, of course, of mass and type, et cetera. Um, but the thing is that if you go to higher redshift, galaxies become fainter <laughs> and smaller, so it's hard. Um, along those lines, though, you can uh, make some headway if I can get the mount please, to go forward, um, by using gravitational lenses. And so this work by Colin Jacobs, where you can identify, where he uses convolutional neural networks to identify strong gravitational lensing candidates, um, essentially looking for needles in a haystack. And uh, the advantage, of course, is now we have lots of uh, imaging, deep imaging surveys like the Dark Energy Survey, where you can apply these um, CNN approaches to identify potential lenses. And the advantage is that you're not limited in terms of the size of the lens. You know, the Einstein radius doesn't have to be less than say one and a half arc seconds, like you would if you were using a fiber from Sloan. Um, and then you can also identify, um, hopefully get the lenses that are at higher redshift so that you can really try to probe how say the dark matter profiles of the lensing galaxies evolve with redshift. Now, of course, Okay, oh, of course, identifying lens candidates is the first step. The next step is actually spectroscopically confirming them. And so we identified an opportunity here um, based on these, this lensing candidate uh, sample from, from Colin and to, uh, to really build on the expertise of, expertise of the Galaxy Evolution team and also unify the themes in the project. And so with that, we, we're really, we've embarked on the Astro 3, 3D Galaxy Evolution with Lenses Survey, um, the acronym being Agile. And with this, we're planning on setting ISM and outflows of background galaxies, um, UV emission line diagnostics of background sources, um, looking at the CGM of foreground lensing galaxies, and then hopefully also um, testing dark matter profiles by uh, looking at the foreground lensing galaxies. So what you see here on the right-hand side are and some nice colored thumbnails of galaxy, uh, strong galaxy lenses from Colin's sample that we're in the process of following up with spectroscopy and also other multi-wavelength observations. So this year, um, actually within the first round with um, ESA, we were awarded, the project was awarded 57 hours and this was work led by Carl Glazebrook and the team at Swinburne, which is um, and so depending on how the when the telescopes open up, hopefully we'll at least be able to get uh, some of that observing done. Um, we also uh, put in an HST proposal, which uh, this, this, this last round, and uh, although it was unsuccessful, it did make it to the second quintile, which for me having, uh, from my experience, I, I'm actually really, really quite pleased with the outcome, given that it was our first attempt and um, the very stiff competition. The fact is that we, we made it to the second quintile, so it should have a pretty good chance in the next round, uh, it, it, um, assuming we're able to address uh, some of the, the issues that were raised. And the, we can because actually we already have a wealth of data in hand that have been collected over the, since about 2018 or so. So in terms of what you can expect with the Agile survey between now and um, 
um, early 2021, the plan is to publish the redshifts of the confirmed lenses um, of, of the subset that we have already in hand, uh, develop the lensing models using the PISCO imaging. PISCO is ground-based um, imaging is on Magellan. Um, and then also prepare, there was one of the discoveries where it's the Rosetta Stones, and this is work led by Sarah Sweet, and then pending observations that she scheduled uh, on the BLT for this year, hopefully getting that out either this year or early next year. Um, with our collaborators at UC Davis, um, they'll be leading the work on saying outflows in the lens galaxies. And then with all, hopefully these um, you know, results under our belt will be in a stronger position to apply for HST time um, in the next round. And also hopefully a, a large proposal on the VLT to really go through and um, confirm all of those, uh, those, those potential strong galaxy lenses. Now, kind of pulling back a little bit and seeing where we are in terms of galaxy evolution and the key deliverable key deliverables that were part of the original program. I thought, I'd like, to, I mean, I, I think we're actually doing quite well. Um, we've, you know, um, we've, we've gone through and data mined the dark energy survey. Uh, we, of course, been able to get um, observing um, observations of a various range of objects using Keck and the VLT, and of course, the data processing and analysis that goes with it. We're always comparing to the models, um, Genesis, less just TNG, and that's just integrated in terms of how we, uh, with the Galaxy Evolution Project, and comparing with our observations. And now we're in the process of really developing the lensing structure and mass models. This is something that's led by Jura Tabayer and Carl Glazebrook and Britt Swinburne. And then we're also in the process of um, working on integrating chemical evolution and ionizing radiation models um, with the observations. Now, the one thing that's sort of still, we haven't really started yet is the data, data archiving and public release, but that's more towards the end of the Center of uh, um, Life Funding um, window, and that's something that we expect to start probably in the next year or two, but it would be a bit premature to, to start doing it now. Now, of course, we can't, um, you know, we all can't ignore the fact that we're, uh, living in a new norm um, in terms of how we actually execute our science. Um, most notably, there's observing delays, um, at least through this year, and this affects a number of the galaxy evolution programs, um, including Magpie, Agile, um, etc. And this means, of course, in the next several years, there's going to be major, even more oversubscriptions in terms of telescope times, so because of, as people try to recruit the lost telescope, um, time over during during this period. And of course, this introduces uncertainties for um, people on fixed term contracts and then for PhD students. However, within Astro 3D, I think we've been able to address these issues in a very constructive manner. Um, the first is that the COVID extension funding for the two to six months um, for um, students and early, uh, uh, early career researchers to work on Astro 3D related research which then allows us to now also focus on publishing results with data in hand and um, integrating simulations that fortunately don't depend on um, telescopes opening. And uh, with a little bit more breathing room, we can hopefully explore and maybe incubate some niche Astro 3D research directions. For example, this gas and stellar metallicities at high and low redshift that I mentioned earlier. And then in the process of developing strengthen international collaborations like Agile and Duvet, which I didn't talk about, but I know Nikki's involved and hopefully we'll have a chance to hear more about it at the next um, uh, science meeting. So I just want everybody to watch this space. And lastly, just thank all of the members of the Galaxy Evolution team and of course Astro 3D for all their hard work. And it's, it's just been really uh, exciting and fun to, to just be part of this project and hopefully uh, moving forward into a bright, and um, productive next few years. Thank you. All right, thank you, V. Um, you did run a bit short, so great. Um, I don't <laughs> see any, oh, there's a question for you uh, in the Q&A. So Caroline is asking, what does the data archiving and public release involve for galaxy evolution? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I assume that this <laughs> it's mostly, um, the, 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 the work, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> so 
So, so, so I mean, obviously all the data that are taken with the VLT, with ESO, they're on the archive, but we would like to provide something that's a bit more user friendly. Catalogs, for example, redshifts for things that are relevant. Uh, I think that's something that in the next year, 18 months, um, we definitely need to discuss. And I think we would certainly look to Magpie to see what their policies and plans are as a, as a way to maybe provide some direction for galaxy evolution more broadly. Thank you.